If you're looking for inspiration, this is the perfect episode for you. Jen Drummond is the author of Breakproof and the first woman to climb the seven second summits, which fun fact is actually more challenging than climbing some of the highest summits like Mount Everest, which she's done too. She's on today though, because she also owns a financial services firm and has managed to step away and allow the business to run by itself versus having to work in it day after day. This freedom has allowed her to become a Guinness World Record holder, present mom of seven, and to do all the media and PR her heart desires. Jen, thank you so much for being here today. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Absolutely. So I always start off the show by asking our guests what their definition of abundance is today. I think abundance is freedom. So it's the freedom to be able to do things because you know you're covered for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there could be a lot that goes into it, whether that is uh, people in place so that you have the time, could be you know, monetarily so that you can go do what you want to do. You're not stuck in a nine to five. It could be a lot of factors. So can you share with me a little bit about what those factors are for you that allow you to have that freedom? Yeah. You know, I think you hit on some of them right there is I have time freedom. I have health freedom. I have financial freedom. I have just the space. So if an opportunity came up, I have the bandwidth to be able to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And if things started to go sideways, I have enough things set aside that allow me to absorb that and not be knocked off my track so easily. Yeah. And so if anybody just types Jen Drummond into Google today, they are going to see your book. They're going to see you on stage. They're going to see all of your TV experiences and some publicity. And, you know, it, it's kind of like, whoa, who is this lady? And then if they just dig like just a little bit further, they will notice that you're a world record holder and an amazing mom. And I think the immediate perception there for a lot of people is like, wow, how do you even get there? So could you back us up just a little bit and give us some of that background? I know you've created an entire financial services business that you've run for 20 years. So tell us a little bit about how you got here. (laughs) We can go back to college days where I was going to school to be pre-med because when I was growing up, the doctors and attorneys had money. In my mind, if I had money, I wouldn't fight because I think that's the only thing my parents ever really fought about. And so that was my solution to that problem. And when I got into college, my chemistry teacher pulled me aside one day. And he's like, hey, Jen, he goes, do you have a few minutes to talk? And I said, sure, let's talk for a few minutes. And he's like, I want you to sit down. And this is just me coming at you as a friend, not anything more. I just thought we should have this conversation. I'm like, okay. He's like, hey, do you know anybody in this class? And I was like, what? I'm like, no, I don't know anybody in this class. He's like, yeah, do you want to know why? I'm like, sure, I'd like to know why. And he's like, they're at the library, like every day on the weekend, studying, doing all that kind of stuff. He goes, do you go to the library on our campus? And I'm like, yeah, no, I don't spend a lot of time at the library. And he's like, that's okay. He's like, I just, I want you to think about that because this career path that you're selecting is going to be hanging out with kids like this for the next eight to 10 years of your life. And when I look at you, I just see an entirely different personality. And I'm just wondering if you're really thinking about what career path you're walking towards. And of course, like any kid in college, I'm like fighting back. I'm like, well, right. And in my head, but he planted that seed. And so I remember talking to my business law teacher after a class one day. I'm like, hey, can we talk for a few minutes? And he's like, sure. Like, you know, I just met with my chemistry teacher and he kind of pointed this out to me and I do really like my business courses and I wanted to just, you know, ask your advice. And my business law teacher was like, Jen, 
you are so cut out for business. Are you kidding me? He goes, it is your personality. He goes, of course, this would be a great field for you. And I'm not saying medicine wouldn't, but the doc, you know, the doctor has a point of who do you spend time with? What energizes you? What sucks energy out of you? And all these different things I didn't really think about because I was truly money focused. And my friend in college graduated a year ahead of me and took a job in finance. And so at this time, he came back to me. He's like, hey, Jen, I just got hired by this company. I'm going to make great money. You're expensive. You should kind of consider this, blah, 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 blah. And so I interviewed for the company, not knowing anything about financial services or what the job entailed or any of the details. And of course, I got hired. And I was so excited about being hired. But the caveat of being hired was I had to leave, like I had to be done with school and I still had a year left. Wow. So I'm like, okay, well, everybody's worried about getting jobs out of school. So I need to figure this out because I'm lucky I have a job because I don't want that problem in the future. So I go to the register and I'm like, hey, look at my credits. Here's what I have left. What can we make happen? And we got creative and thought of some ways that I, I did summer school and some internship credits and things I could be done by the end of the summer. I'm like, okay, great. And then I call my parents and I walk them. So I'm like, hey, I got a job. I'm going to graduate early and all this happy news. And my parents were not so happy. And I just remember thinking like, come on, like what, what's going on? Why are you missing the boat? And my mom and dad sat me down. They're like, hey, listen, Jen, we're grateful you have a job. We're grateful that you figured out how to get a school early. We're a little concerned that you're young. This is a career pivot entirely since the last time you talked to us about what you were doing. And financial services is a hard industry. And I'm like, I'll be fine. I'll be good. Like I'm, I'm in blah, 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 blah. My parents are like, okay, fine. But then you have to commit a year. So no matter what, you have to stay at that job for a year and really give it an effort. I'm like, of course, I'm going to stay at this job for a year. What are yeah, you talking about? It'll be fine. Right? And so anyways, I graduate. I take this job in finance two weeks in. I'm like leaving the office every day sobbing. Mm. I hate the job. I call the college that I went to. Hey, can I come back? I was kidding. I don't want to graduate. It was a bad decision. Like, no, sorry. Like it'd be like maybe it's semester, but right now school started. There's not an option, blah, 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 blah. Mm. And I went to Staples mm. and bought a calendar and circled 365 days later. So when I could quit this job because I was not calling my parents, and that was the introduction to the financial service. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Okay. So you hit so many things there for me because I also sat there in high school and like researched basically like what's the best career to like make money? <laughs> Where can I go? What do I need to do? I ended up thinking that I was going to be a CPA. So I did pursue accounting, I had this whole plan was going to graduate with my MBA in like five years and take the CPA test, like do all this stuff. Right. And a couple years in, I was like, I hate this. Like it's awful. And even just to, and we have a similarity because I was loving my business law class. And I was thinking like, what do I do with this? I love the finance classes. Like, can I just ditch the accounting piece and just go this route? And by the time I talked to somebody, I would lose so many credits that would push me back graduating. So I was like, crap, I have to suffer through this accounting degree, right? And what I really wanted to do was just pivot into finance. So I did it. I got a job doing audit. I've done some different project management roles. But the whole time, I wish I had a chemistry instructor like you did, because the whole time, no one directly sat me down and said, like, something doesn't fit here. This doesn't make sense for you. But I would hear little comments. Like everybody here is wearing like blue suits and you're wearing a pink jacket or like what, just something like that. And they didn't mean to be derogatory, but the message underlying all of that was like, you don't fit in here. You're not this typical like auditor. And of course, at that point, podcasting had, it was not on my radar at all, but it just really helps for someone to be clear about what they see and directing you and giving you some advice because it could completely change everything that you do from there forward. 
So in taking that advice and getting into financial services, of course, you didn't like it at first because I think you were working for someone else. And what along that path made you shift and go, you know, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to create my own business or, or go out on my own. What happened there? Have you ever pictured yourself hosting your own show? Maybe it's time. This show is edited and produced by podcastabundance.com. And if you like what we're doing, we'd like to do it for your business too. I'm Virginia Elder, and I've been helping independent financial service professionals launch and grow their podcasts since 2019. I coach you through branding, establishing structure and workflow, strategy, and recording your episodes. Then my team and I professionally edit your audio and video so you don't have to. We'll even write your episode descriptions and titles so that when potential customers turn to Google, your show appears in their search results. Elevate your brand's visibility, become more approachable, and attract potential clients all with your own podcast. I'm here to hold your hand and make podcasting the exciting, up-leveling experience it should be, skirting you past the tech and software struggles. Take the first step by booking a call with me using the link in the show notes or by visiting podcastabundance.com. Now, on to the rest of the show. Yeah. So what I really didn't like about the industry was cold calling. Like I didn't realize when I signed up to be a financial advisor that I had to build my book of business and never came up in the interview process. I didn't even know to ask it. I just assumed like they had a book of business and I was helping them take care of their people. So the cold calling was just mind numbing and so hard and so frustrating and everything. So I realized like, okay, I'm doing this for a year. I can either have it be this miserable experience for a year or I'm going to need to figure out how to turn this experience around and have it look like something else. So I ended up buying one of those pop guns that had like the foam ball at the end. And so when somebody hung up on the phone with me, which was, you know, like 99 times an hour, I would shoot them with my gun. And, I, and then, then I put the ball back on and it was like a way for me to get my power back. Like you said, no, fine. I said no. And then I would like call the next person and, you know, and then like when you do classes, they teach you about smiling and dialing and blah, 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 blah. But like, here's the thing with cold calling, it's a numbers game. So once you are in it long enough and can figure it out and you can de-emotionalize it, all of a sudden you can realize, okay, if I make this many calls, I'm going to talk to this many people, this many people are going to come in and I'm going to close that one person and I'm going to make X number of dollars. And when I like figured that out, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to make good money. And so my first year out of college, I made like great money. Like I think more than what my parents made combined. And so to me, I was like, whoa, like this might not be awesome, but this is working, right? And so I started to build up a client base and really loved servicing the people and helping them and educating them. Like there's a lot of beautiful parts of financial advisory. Um, it's just that client acquisition piece is a little difficult for most of us. And so once I started getting good at it, again, like you learn the mouse trap, you learn how to do the thing. And I'm like, I don't need to do this under somebody else's umbrella. I have enough experience. I can do this on my own and take a higher override and figure those pieces out. So I ended up working for them for four years and then went out on my own. Wow. Wow. And I think the value there is you learned that, you know, numbers game, you learned how to make it fun. You learned all of these like super valuable lessons from a very young age, like right out the bat. <laughs> And you've been able to take that throughout your life, like into like entrepreneurship is a massive number numbers game. You get lots of no's. There's lots of hard days for most entrepreneurs. You're alone in your home office for a very long period of time. And there's a lot that can mess with you mentally, which is also something that I think you've conquered for the most part is that mental game. Yeah. Well, I think that was the beauty of I needed to build my own book of business 
And so then once I learned how to build my own book of business, I was like, okay, I'm not really getting a lot from this company I'm working for. If they would have given me a book of business, I wouldn't have known how to build one and I wouldn't have had the confidence in myself to exit. But my thought was, okay, let's say I lose some of my clients because they want to stay with this firm. Fine. The amount of clients I think that will come with me is going to make up that gap. And I've done it before. I can do it again. And there's no better time than now. Yeah. And then when, like fast forward us just a little bit as you're building this business, how did you kind of accelerate your role from worker, cold caller, business builder to true owner, CEO, I get to step back and this runs for me? You know, I think that's a, an evolution. It's not an overnight decision. It's you hire one person and then that one person does a really good job at whatever they're doing and that frees you up to do other things. And then you sit down and you evaluate, okay, what other things are on my plate that I don't like to do that I can hire out? And then you hire out that next piece and then you make sure like everybody's getting along and working together because there's now a three-way relationship instead of a two-way relationship. And then I let people figure out what they needed. And so then they hired the next person because then I didn't have to be involved in that. And that removed me from that management and decision-making piece. And so it's, it's one at a time. You don't climb the mountain overnight. You just make these little decisions and then you know, you lose people along the way because they have a baby or decide to move out of state because of a husband's job or some other piece. And once they're gone for a little bit, you realize, okay, what were they doing that we need to have picked up again? Or what should we overlap so we don't have that gap anymore? And that's really how it built. It was very organic and based on needs. Did you have this vision of like, one day I'm going to step back, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to be on TV, I'm going to do all these things. Did you have that vision back then or did it happen? Yeah, no, I mean, what really happened was when you're in finance, you understand the time value of money and you understand like, okay, I'm going to put myself into a position when I'm in my 40s or 50s to really be able to let money sit and grow. I don't want to be one of those moms that has her kids in daycare all day. So how do I, you know, like it was always needs driven, to be honest with you. It was, okay, I have these kids. I want to be home. What do I need to do that allows me to be home with them? And I grew up in an area where being a stay at home mom was like the dream. And so here I am like trying to build that so that I can live the dream. And I have these wonderful children, which are full time plus <laughs> until they start going to school full time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I'm sitting there like, what do I do when I know I need to be on call in case something happens or someone's sick or whatever, but I also like, you know, want to be this mom kids are really a job that I can take and do. And I had hired myself out of the business and it was doing so well that it didn't make sense for me to go back in the business because I felt like I would have been poking at too many things. And I, I just felt like they were doing such a good job that it was like, okay, I did this. What else can I do? And I kind of sat with that for a while, to be honest with you. Yeah. So that's perfect because a lot of times I think people start businesses or thinking they're going to scale their business or they're going to do X, Y, Z so that they can be home with kids. So like for me at the time, I was really frustrated that I had to leave work to get on a, or leave home to get on a train to go downtown like it's 6 a.m. So of course I didn't get to see my babies in the morning. Then by the time I left work, got on the train, came back, it was the rush of pick up the kids, get ready for soccer, cook dinner. Like it was just insane. And operating on adrenaline essentially through your entire day because you're hustling at work so that you can leave early so that you can get home. Like it was just nuts and I couldn't handle it anymore. And I was like, you know what? Like there's got to be something to where I can walk my kids to and from school. I can be there. I can take them to soccer on a um, more relaxed uh, notion here. Like it just needed to fit what I wanted for my lifestyle. So I think 
most business owners start with this almost like a dream lifestyle in mind. And unfortunately, most of the time what happens is you get into the weeds of building your business and you're accidentally replicating the culture or the hours or whatever was the the knife that you experienced in corporate. And so did you ever run into that or have to navigate around that? Well, I mean, when I was young, right, like I graduated from college and took, started in financial services when I was 21, I worked 12 to 15 hour yeah. days, like zero question about it whatsoever. But the reality was, is my friends were still in college mm. and everybody was kind of working those hours or doing things at that time. So it didn't feel super invasive to my life. And I think one of the things that finances drills into you is compounding interest. Like if you can do this hard now, you're going to accumulate and allow that to like build and grow for you. So in financial services, you can be successful and it can take you eight years. You can double down and you can be successful and it'll take you four or even more so in two, right? Like we know the industry works. We know the field works. It's just how hard are you going to work to make it happen? So I was very unbalanced in the beginning but willingly, because I knew that it was a front loaded career. And so if I front loaded it, then later on in life, I wouldn't have to work as much and I would be making more than what would make sense. So I think that's important to understand in any business. And I, the more I'm in business, the more I realize like it is eight to 10 years doing something very intently, very focused, very time consuming till you start having the bandwidth to be able to do these different pieces, sometimes earlier, sometimes not, but you're also learning what you want to hand off and what you don't. You're learning how to become a better leader. Like there's just periods of growth that need to happen that take time to play out. That you can't necessarily skip. Like you only learn by doing and slogging through it and you can get all the advice in the world, but you kind of have to experience it to get good at it. So bring us to today where you do have this book that you've written and this podcast and various PR appearances. Are you still kind of in that? Because it's like a new brand, right? It's not a financial services business anymore. It's your own brand, your personal brand. So are you applying some of those same principles that you learned. You're like, all right, this is the the period of hard work so that it can do something else for me. Or talk to me about your perspective there. Yeah. You know, so for, it's a different deal for me now because I'm building with the family instead of pre-family. And I am in a space that's highly saturated and unregulated So that's been interesting. Like I was in finance and I think one of my biggest struggles with finance was, is like you'd help these people get set up for retirement and be ready to do this next stage of life. And they hadn't taken care of their health or their mindset. And so now all of a sudden they're not here to enjoy it, right? Like this money you set aside for this life that they dreamed of, they're not physically able to participate in it. So when the kids started going to school, the financial service piece was working. Like I really went hard into mindset and health because I felt that was like the one piece that money can't buy. And so how do we help with that piece, which then helps with the other pieces? So one, it was just like a natural curiosity that was driving me forward. There wasn't really a business model running it. It was, I'm raising seven children. I'm a leader to them. I need to instill these leadership principles and demonstrate them. And what better way to demonstrate that than to be climbing physical mountains where they see, oh, guess what? Mom didn't want to work out today, but she did it. Mom doesn't want to eat healthy today, but we're all eating healthy because that sets us up for a better tomorrow. So just teaching them like the different types of things that we need to invest in ourselves to have a successful future. And so I'm not doing this like, hey, in 10 years, this is what this is going to be. 
this is very much, this is who I am. If people join the, the trip or want to take the climb or want to be a part of it, fantastic. If they don't, that's okay. I'm doing this anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you were able to sit there and say, okay, here are the various facets of life that I see or that are important to me or that I've seen fall off for other people. So I focused and kind of checked the boxes for lack of a better term here and here, but let me focus on mindset and health because this is what I see people struggle with. And I want to be a better leader to my family, right? And that you were able to kind of evaluate that. Was there a, a mentor or a book or like something that kind of cued you into that? Or was it literally just observation? I mean, I would say my car wreck was probably like the big line in the sand for me. So in 2018, I was in a horrific car crash that should have taken my life. And we have no clue how it didn't. There's not been a scenario rebuilt where I walk away, let alone thrive like I'm doing today. And when that car wreck happened, it happened around the same time that I lost a girlfriend too, who was running on a trail, slipped, fluke accident, hit her head and never came oh, home. Oh man! And so I was like metabolizing these major events, trying to figure out, make, make sense of it and let it land in my head. Yeah. And really what I came to come to the conclusion of is we don't get to choose when we die but we sure get to choose how we live. And was I really living? And so then that opened up the door like, okay, this life isn't forever. I mean, I know we hear that, but to actually live that is a different story. And so I started really getting serious about if I was done, my life was over, what would my obituary say? What would my resume say? And there are so many facets that I hadn't even tapped into I was like, okay, let's get busy. Let's start doing these other pieces. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to inspiring our kids, I think that's a whole nother level of drive and passion and angst, <laughs> right? Uh, as a mom, inspiring a crowd of people, sure, that's exciting. It might get your heart beating, but when it comes to thinking about your kid's future, there's almost, that's like that mama bear thing that comes out. There's almost nothing that can change your mind from making their lives better than potentially what we had growing up or even the path, like a career path or anything like that. You're just trying to better everything. So give me some like insider info of what this looks like as a family. What have they said to you about your endeavors and, and potentially being inspired or understanding why we're eating healthy at dinner, even though we don't want to. You know, when you take on a goal that can threaten your life, <laughs> like every single time you go out in the mountain, it makes decisions very black and white, right? Like I need to do this because I promised you I'd come home and this gives me the best odds of doing mm -hmm. so. So you really get clear on what your goal is and that goal gives you direction on what you can say yes or no to, because it either brings you closer to your goal or further away from it. So we started really talking about goal setting and what it meant to set a goal and what it meant to achieve a goal and what it meant to, you know, build momentum in the middle of the goal when it's messy and you don't want to do it and all the different pieces. We also spent a lot of time just talking about what it means to be a mom what it means to be a kid in today's world, what it means to like, what are our definitions of these things? When you're raising children, you realize you have different definitions of things like mom's clean and Jack's clean are two different <laughs> cleans. And so we have to sit down and talk about like, Hey, mom thinks a bed made makes a clean room. Mm -hmm. I understand you see that differently, but you're at mom's house. So this is how it's going to roll. And just like having space to get curious and redefine what it means. And when I decided to take on this world record pursuit and really focus on the book and just building this concept of being break proof in your pursuits, like I had a conversation with my kids, like I'm going to be doing things different than I've done before. And that's going to change up the dynamics here. And if it doesn't feel good, I need to know because I won't know if you don't say something. And so we really approached it as 
Are we doing check-ins? Is everybody still on board? Did this thing cost more, like time-wise, money-wise, or whatever, than what we expected? Does it still make sense for us at this time with things that we know now? And just allowing us to have those consistent conversations and providing the space for people to participate, like changed our entire family dynamics in the most healthy way possible. Yeah. Just another level of communication entirely rather than like, I'm the mom, you do what I say. There's like no feedback loop versus we're a team essentially. Let's make this a great experience for all of us. And I need that feedback so that I know that you're getting what you need as a child. It kind of empowers them from a young age. So even even though they have you as this leader and as this, quite frankly, inspiration, you've also just given them tools to use that they will never know they didn't have, right? Like some of us went into corporate not having those communication tools or not knowing how to speak up for ourselves or tell someone, hey, I'm not getting what I need from you right now you know, whatever it was, didn't know how to have those conversations, but you've given them that like from a young age. So I can already see how their trajectory is going to be amazing. (laughs) Yeah. 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 You know, we use the word Everest, right? Like I climbed Mount Everest and that was a big mountain and a big undertaking. And so at our house, it's what's your Everest? Because maybe their Everest is trying out for the golf team or they have a test this week or whatever it is. And if we all can identify what each other's Everest is, then we know how to show up for each other. Because it might not look like an Everest to me, but I don't get to define that for them. They have to define that for themselves. And my job is to support them or whatever they have going on. And so when I have the language to understand like, oh, this is your Everest. Okay, cool. I know how to support you now. And that has really helped us all just become better humans. Absolutely. So take that concept. And I know in your book, you have seven strategies to build resilience and achieve your life goals. So this, hey, what's your Everest? But then also these seven strategies, I can see how they apply to business owners, but I'm going to let you share a little bit about that. Like how can business owners take this and, and make it... Um, a a tool for us to become that CEO or establish that lifestyle, whatever it is, that's our goal. You know, I think one of the biggest lessons I took from writing the book and like doing this whole thing is big mountains take big teams. So the bigger your vision, the bigger your goal, the bigger the idea that you have that you want to bring to life, the more people it's going to take to bring it to life. You don't have five people running Amazon, right? Like Amazon is ginormous. And so if you have this big goal, like do you have enough people to really make it happen? Because I think a lot of times we start down this path and then we start running into resistance or headwinds or obstacles or setbacks. And we like, can we can weather a few of those? But then we're not as strong to continue to climb, right? And so we run out of energy and then we start negotiating with ourselves. Well, I didn't really want that or maybe I can dial it back here or whatever. And I just encourage you to stop for a second and say, okay, wait, I'm having these feelings of doubt, of fear, of overwhelm, of exhaustion. My first question should be to myself, do I have enough people on this team? Like, do I have enough people where I can take a break and someone can step in or I can look at this from a different angle and I don't have another fire starting somewhere else in the building? And so I think any business, any pursuit, anything you're doing in life, do you have a big enough team to make it happen? Mm -hmm. And team being coaches, like from the top down, right? Like team advising you, but then team also helping you get there, right? Like I know you've had climbing coaches and the whole pack of people carrying equipment up and, and helping you literally climb the mountain. So in business- And running things at home. 
right? Yeah. Like, so I'm on Mount Everest. I have a team taking care of the kids. I have the team taking care of this. I have people taking care of that. When I'm on the mountain, you have somebody making food, somebody setting up tents, somebody like there's so, like Everest is an easy climb if you're trained because there's so many people doing so many parts of it. Like your only job is to take care of yourself and walk up the mountain. Okay. Like you can go a long time if that's your only job, especially if you're a business owner or a mother or somebody at home who's playing a logistics officer, making sure we have food in the house. Everybody gets to their activities. The business is running. Bills are being paid. Like there's so many roles that we play that take up bandwidth. And so you have to realize like the more people you hire, the more bandwidth you have, the further you can go. That's a really good uh, reminder. I think I think we know that, right? It's like hire someone for this role or hire, you know, get a coach, do this, do that. But when you really step back and think about everything in your life, personally and professionally that you're responsible for, you start to recognize like, oh, I have a lot on my plate. This is why I'm stressed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? Definitely. So fast forward, you know, even just a little more with us, like after you wrote the book um, or even maybe while you're writing the book, you, you know, okay, I've done these climbs. I'm a world record holder. I'm starting to get some press. I need to capitalize on this. Like I've got to take this momentum and do something with it. So what did that look like? Because I think sometimes, even just as a business owner, let's say you just get featured in Forbes or something and you're like, yay. A lot of times people don't know even what to do with that feature and don't know how to lean into it or capitalize on it. So could you share with us a little bit about your experience in that? One, like a one hit wonder in the media is not going to help you. I mean, it's like, gives you some kind of, like it allows you to be like, yay, I'm doing it or I have confidence in myself, but like you need to like have that be a little bit more consistent to be able to play off of it and you need to be ready to use it, right? So we'll get the video clips back from the stations that we've been on. So Good Morning America or the Today Show or whatever else like that. And we'll put the clips in different social pieces. We'll throw back like, oh, remember like this time last year I was on the Today Show. It was such an honor. Um, I love sharing this story. I've spoken about this over the last year at XYZ Company. Really had an impact. I just wanted to like bring it up to everybody's mind again. If there's any way I can help you, blah, 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 blah. So like that's a piece of material that you're allowed to use like even a year later right? Or like, and share it with people again, or reflect back on it or send it to, I mean, I was on KTLA in January and then I was just on again in August because I reached out to him and I just said, Hey, I know I was on the show like six months ago. I'm like, Oh, perfect. We don't let people on in more than once in a six month period of time. But since it's been six months, you're right. Your segment did well. Love to have you on again. Hey, yeah. Right. So it's like very much one, you want to make sure your segment goes well, because mm -hmm. if you're saying they have all the stats on that. So if your segment goes well, you're sharing that with your email list on your social media channels, on different platforms, you're going to tell those people like, Hey, I made a sizzle reel. I used this clip from you guys. Thank you so much. I'm going to share it with everybody going forward. They love to know that you're continuing to push the things that they've created and then you keep those relationships strong so that if they run into something where they're like, oh, there's a question on Mount Everest or there's a question with mountains or there's a holiday coming up that talks about International Mountain Day or whatever it is, you become their top of mind. And then it becomes a consistent thing. And then people are like, oh, this Jen must be up to something because I saw her on this channel or that channel or this piece. And it just builds that curiosity and curiosity is opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I think that goes back to almost like the marketing philosophy of just anything. It's like people need to um, see you or hear from you or see your product or whatever it is, like seven plus times. There's arguments all in there, right? It's like minimum of seven, but then it could be like 21. So you're right. Like the more we see you on various channels, the more likely for one, you're going to 
sell your book, get more speaking engagements, do all these additional things that really do turn into income for you. So yeah, I agree. Like there's no benefit truly to having that like one feature, that one hit wonder, like you say. So as you have been on this journey for this past couple years, is there any decision or action or not even a single feature, but something that happened where you were really able to trace back and connect the dots and say, oh, this led to this led to that. And this turned into income for me so that potentially you could replicate that piece. Like, has there been any clues in your journey that have really helped you? It's hard to say because there's been so yeah. much. It's, right? it's been a, it's been impressive, like a wild couple of years, right? Yeah, it really has. And um, I will say that having a strong foundation locally is so important. Like I can call the local radio station and go on the radio at any point. And so that's just an awesome relationship to have. There's like news stations down in Salt Lake City that I have good relationships with that I could probably go on pretty easily because here's what can happen. You can go on a local station and for some reason, nothing's going on in the news that day, really. Then other stations can pick it up, right? So if I interview with a local Fox, all of a sudden other stations might pick it up and run that story in their market because they're just looking for something. And now all of a sudden you're getting more reach off of that one piece. So I think it's, I mean, it's great to be on the Good Morning Americas and Jennifer Hudson and some of these wonderful shows I've had great opportunities on, but just as significant are these little ones in your next door neighborhood that allow you to be consistent and allow you to, you know, get reach that you might not have otherwise gotten. Yeah. And you touched on it earlier. It's like building and maintaining those relationships just because you had them on or just because they had you on and you said, thank you one time. It doesn't have to stop there. You can reach back out and say, Hey, thanks again. Like I was just thinking about that. Or here's like you said, that sizzle reel or whatever, like maintain that communication because you never know when they might need you back. I think that goes across business. Definitely. And just making sure you have like sound bites ready to go. You want to make this easy for other people to participate. So you need to lead the way. So you're coming to them with the idea that you're pitching and here's what we're doing and here's what I can offer. And, oh, you want to interview me? Here's seven great questions and here's the video footage or here's photos that go with that. So then their producer has a very easy time to create all the thing. And it just is a win for everybody. So as somebody that's trying to build their brand, what can you make easy for others? Amazing. So talk to me a little bit about your podcast, Seek Your Summit. I know there's been, you started out with like some different name way back when, changed it to Seek Your Summit. Like podcasting is definitely one of those things that never stops changing, right? The industry is changing. You might want to rebrand. You might adjust your style. Like there's so many things that change constantly. Share your philosophy and your experience about the podcast. I know you enjoy it. Yeah. No, you know, like the podcast has been through a lot of renditions and evolutions. And I think that's kind of the point. And when I first recorded my first episode, I was on Zoom in a closet that I decorated with um, foam so that it would absorb the sound. The glue hadn't really dried. So I swear like the glue was curing with the lights in the room and I was in there trying not to get high. I mean, I can laugh about it now. And I look at those beginning episodes and I was terrible. Like I was so bad, right? But you need to get the reps in. And what happens with the podcast is when you get the reps in on a show, when you go on to television, you're that much more experienced. And so that was a huge piece of, we weren't even doing it for the podcast in the beginning. In the beginning, we were doing it to media train myself so that I would be good on television. I ended up really liking podcasting. I ran into a couple of people where it worked out where we could do them in yeah. person. I really liked doing in-person podcasts. And as I was going through the brand and just realizing 
you know, my first podcast was called take a break with Jen. And it was just like, okay, we go, go, go. Here's a chance to start from the saw and then go, go, go again. And that was the concept of that title. And then I realized like I was really interviewing people that were gold medalist or started a business or had some crazy pivot in their life. So they were these reinventors of themselves. And I felt like take a break didn't really line up with what we were actually talking yeah. about. What we really ended up the conversations being about was like, how did you get to the top? Like, what did you do? What's your secret sauce? What's your like philosophy on life? And so that felt more appropriate to name what's Seek Your Summit. So that's why that name change happened. That's why we've gone to in-person interviews only, just because I love that energy exchange. And for me, the podcast is as much building my network and finding about other people to elevate their story mm -hmm. as it is for the end listener. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the piece that's missing a lot of times is people don't realize the networking power of podcasting, like within the podcast space. When you interview another podcaster on your show, they may have you on or not or whatever, but there's still this bond that's created within that podcasting realm. So you might have networking events or other things that you go to, mom events, whatever, but the networking power of podcasting, I don't think is talked about enough. The other piece I appreciate that you touched on is how it was media training for you. A lot of people say like, oh, I want to be a speaker. I want to do this or I want to do that. But they've literally never been behind a microphone and they're super uncomfortable with it. They're awkward on stage or whatever it is. And podcasting, yes, you can't see my face full body, but it is definitely experience. Like you said, you're putting in the reps and you're getting used to speaking, whether on script or on the spot, whatever it is, but you're getting used to being behind the camera. So I think that's super important. Yeah. And you just work through your stories, right? If you think of a comedian that's successful, they normally don't come out with like their great joke at the first presentation they will workshop that joke for a long time until they're ready to put it into a script that they deliver to multiple stages. And so I really view podcasting as this chance, like, let me tell my story with a bunch of different people. And I'm going to figure out what do I want to accentuate? What do I want to cut out? How do I make this shorter or longer? And you just become really familiar with your material and things that you like to talk about. And that makes you a better communicator all the way around. Absolutely. Well, we talked a little bit about how you set up your business to where you could really have this freedom, going back to your definition of abundance. So then when you think about integrating writing a book and climbing, so there's this whole like personal fitness component, so then I want to have a podcast and, and you're adding things to your plate. How have you navigated managing your time, managing your energy as a business owner, as a mom, as a podcaster, as an author, like all these things, like, can you give us some advice on that? Cause I feel like that time management piece is really important. Yeah. I mean, I think the time management piece is everything and it's not just the time management, it's the energy management, which I think is even more important. So do you get energized being on a podcast or does it take energy away from you? If it takes energy away from you, you have to watch how many of those activities you can take on during a day. And if it adds energy to you, okay, great. How long, how far, and all these different pieces. So for me, I'm always checking in energy-wise. Do I have the bandwidth to take this and do this at the level that I want to? Or do I not right now and I need to push this activity off? And that's how I'm managing myself more than okay, I have an hour and a half for this or two hours for yeah, that. Yeah, it's more about that internal check-in. Mm -hmm. It's really good advice. Well, tell us where we can buy your book, where we can follow you, all of that good stuff so that we can tag along. And I just want to tell you, I really appreciate your time today. Yeah, no, my pleasure. So you can find me at jendrummond.com. I'm Jen with two N's. You're also welcome to text the word Everest. So the number 33777, you'll get a video of um, the Milky Way galaxy going over Everest Space Camp. I love that video. I keep it on my phone. Anytime I'm overwhelmed or exhausted or just like trying to figure out a problem, 
I'll watch that video and remind myself, okay, it's insignificant. This world's amazing. I'm good. Like, let's regroup. And then once you do that, you'll be in our network and get updates on climbs, adventure, speaking engagements, and different ways that you can participate in our little world. That's awesome. I love that. Even when you're talking about the video, I was like, oh, that sounds wonderful. I took a deep breath there. <laughs> so thank you. I'm going to second that and say, okay, everybody go get that video. Do that text. Tell, tell us that number again. Text. What was it? Yeah. So the word Everest to 33777. All right. Everybody do that right now as you're listening. Thank you so much, Jen. I appreciate this. Yeah, thank you.